All right, thanks for tuning in for our Thursday advanced classes with the Niagara Broadsword Academy. Today we're going to go through our warm-up and then we're going to answer a quick question by John uh, and then I'm going to pass you off to another instructor to go through some more advanced techniques. So, uh, the first thing that we're going to do, as we always do, is we're going to warm up with a bit of footwork. Now, I hope that you already got yourself warmed up uh, by stretching out a little bit and get your heart rate up uh, through anything from jogging, burpees, uh, whatever it is that you do to uh, to get that heart rate going. And then we're going to pass from there directly into our advanced classes right now. So the first thing that we're going to start with is our footwork. Now, John asked a question about footwork, so we're going to be focusing on footwork in the advanced class uh, today as well. But of course, every day we're going to warm up with our standard footwork. We're going to start with our regimental, and we're just going to be advancing from third and second and we're going to be advancing through our space in third and second. We're going to be retreating in our space in third and second. And then we're going to shift sideways. We're going to do some transiting sideways uh, in basically just in second position the entire time. So we're going to be going side to side. Make sure that you're moving the uh, correct foot so that you don't cross your feet when you're doing this. And then we can, of course, circle as well. And the same thing here. You're going to make sure that you're moving the correct foot so that when you're circling, you're not crossing your feet. So those are the basics. We are able to explore our space a little bit, move around. Now we're going to do uh, something a little bit extra. We're going to go from second, and we're going to uh, advance on the inside with a thrust, uh, and we're also going to go on the outside with a thrust. Now, keep in mind that you're leading with your hand, leveling that out, and letting basically your sword pull your body forward and dropping into that thrust. Now what we're going to focus on today is something that we don't do a lot of in our class and that's going to try to get that try to get that thrust uh, down low um, so that it can be as far as possible. So hopefully I can illustrate why you want your thrust to be lower in some cases um, so that you can see how it can be used sometimes. But of course you don't always want to do it. Sometimes you just want a quick jab from uh, second to third position um, to make that hit and make that connection and get out of town. But sometimes you do want a lengthy lunge uh, so that you can sort of uh, surprise your opponent or so that they can't rely on a specific measure and so that they uh, feel the heat of being within range. So <clears throat> uh, normally we just step forward into second and I recommend people stay fairly centered uh, with their thrust and they just thrust their arm forward like this. You can throw your hand back to uh, counterbalance that movement as well. So this is our standard thrust that we normally teach people. It doesn't go very far. Uh, and the reason why the thrust that goes farther drops it down is because uh, you're using your legs this way instead of this way. So you're using them horizontally instead of vertically. If I'm in my second position, I normally recommend that your third position be uh, right where your toes are, put your heel there, and that's your third position. And if you're thrusting from there, that's not very far thrust. You can also lean the body forward to make that thrust a little bit extra. Don't lock that knee, remember? Uh, lean the body forward to get a little bit of extra range on that thrust. And of course, you're going to want to kick that back leg forward to get that full extension. So that's where we're at with our normal thrust. Lead with the hand, step forward into third, lean that body forward, and kick the back leg to make that thrust. Now, as you can see, my structure is now forward, and I have a lot of weight on the front leg. I can drop this leg down like this, and I can roll out this way, and kick off the heel to retreat. However, if I wanted to get some extra range, I can use the wall to demonstrate here. If I wanted to get some extra range uh, by stepping forward, I'm going to end up lower. And you can see that my thigh is becoming more and more horizontal. The maximum extent, of course, being that your thigh is completely horizontal to the ground. But this is very difficult to do. It's like, a, it's like a yoga position, practically. But you can see how much further I can reach, almost a full uh, foot or more that I have of reach in there, rather than being in my standard third position. See, I just did the wrong thing. I'll explain why that was wrong, too, so you can see. <clears throat> From here, I kicked all of the weight of my body up, so that I could kick it up and then catch my body weight with my front leg again. Don't do that. What you want to do is you want to drop the weight out the back leg so that you can roll out that way and the weight ends up on your back leg. That way you're going the right direction. You're not kicking up and catching yourself. You're kicking back. So that's the first 
That's the first problem. Uh, and the, one of the things that we should address with doing these low thrusts. And again, you want to be capable of doing a low thrust, but you don't necessarily want to uh, be doing it all the time. So you're going to practice nice and slow so you don't hurt anything. You're going to reach to a uh, full extension, something that you feel is safe, but uh, extended. And you're going to lead with the hand, lead with the hand into the full extension, and then you're going to extend that back leg while you're leaning forward to get the full effect and then dropping back that way. You can use your back arm as a counterbalance as well. We often have our students using it this way uh, when they're doing these thrusts. So you can start in this position near your hip or near your chest, and as you lead with the hand, then you can throw your weight back, and then you can roll out to retreat. So, and you're back into this position. And you can lead with the hand, throw your weight forward, roll back. Lead with the hand, throw your weight forward, roll back. Lead with the hand, throw your weight forward, roll back. So we're just going to do a couple of these nice slow motions. And, <coughs> oopsie, try not to tip. Uh, so do uh, a couple of those. Then keeping in mind that your hand is on the inside of your knee, so looking from your position. Uh, we're leading with the hand, putting the forward, rolling back. Forward like this, rolling back. Forward like this, rolling back, keeping the hand on this side of the knee, and then with our outside guards, we're keeping the hand on that side of the knee as we do the exact same action. So you could come from an outside or any other position. You can come from here and bring it up the correct way into the thrust. So similarly, with the hand outside the knee, uh, leading with the hand, stepping forward, leaning forward, and then rolling back. There we go. Forward and back, forward and back, forward and back, forward and back. So as you can see, we follow our usual method when we're uh, pursuing these thrusts, and we start with understanding how the footwork works. So it's not your short uh, third position, your regular third position that you're using to exchange blows. Um, it's a much more extended maneuver, and you're kicking off that back leg, leaning forward, and of course you're leading with the hand, as always. So we're working with the footwork first, and then we start involving the sword, and uh, we start doing solo drills, so we're just working on our own. Now for many of us, that's where we're going to stop, because we don't have the resources to continue from there. However, if you have a pal, or you have a partner, uh, who can act as a target, um, the next thing that we want to do is the target drill. So the target drill will consist of finding a target in your home, uh, such as this book bookcase. And the first thing you want to do is you want to do the complete uh, lunge. Just get into the position you're going to be in and find your range. And then, once you've done that, then you can go back into your uh, into your second position and you can um, make the you can make the maneuver from there. Lead with the hand. Lead with the hand. Boom, and back. So you can uh, find a target in your house that you can use for that if you can. If you don't have a pal or you don't have a partner that you can use, then uh, then feel free to wrap up at the, at the solo part, and we'll continue in the future with, uh, with, with finding partners. Now, if you happen to have uh, someone who is trained in any sort of system, um, after that you're going to do a, an exchange. So you're going to... Um, receive and make cuts, and then at the appropriate time, we're going to make a thrust. Now, in this particular case, what would be ideal is to have your partner try to retreat on the thrust rather than to try to deflect it or to try to do something else. So when you're making your cuts and guards and you're just uh, cutting at your opponent and making a uh, regular um, uh, exchange drill, and then at a certain point, you're going to load your thrust, you're going to make your thrust, and you're going to suggest your partner to try to retreat as quickly as they can away from your thrust. Uh, and this will give you the range that you need to try, to try to throw that long thrust out as far as it can go. So that will be a good exchange drill. And then, of course, once you're done with the rhythm or the exchange drill, uh, you're going to move to educational sparring, where you try to get this thrust uh, for the same reason. There's two reasons you might do it. One is uh, as someone is in closing, and this is a favorite of JMAS, 
is as they make that step to close, they're sort of committed. So once their weight has moved, especially if they move their back leg because they're closing in on you, so they've moved their back leg, which means their weight is moving forward, which means they have to redirect it backwards to try to get out of the way. So as soon as you see them move that back leg to close into range, then you throw that thrust out. And you th throw the thrust to hit basically right in front of them because they're going to be moving into that space as they move forward. So they're here and they're stepping to first or they're stepping this way. And as soon as they lift that back leg, you throw that thrust at them and they try to redirect and they either uh, get stuck where they are or of course you stick them. So it's a great uh, thrust to throw as soon as someone's stepping into that extended range because they also probably don't expect it, especially if you've been exchanging at a relatively close distance by just using that third and second position and you're just exchanging nice and easy and close. And then at the beginning of one bout, for example, as soon as they close into range, bam, you shoot uh, very far uh, and snipe them right off the bat. So those are two great situations to use it in, in educational sparring or in a tournament environment. All right, move you into a slightly better position to see my feet, uh, because in this part we're going to specifically be discussing the positions of the feet and so on. In the uh, previous uh, uh, thrusting drill, you're really just using regular orientation of your feet and so on and so forth. You just want to make sure of a couple of other things that I wanted to mention. First of all, uh, and we see this a lot, is you definitely don't, in any of your thrusting or any of your maneuvers at all, you don't want to be cutting that foot in and stepping on the balls of your feet like this. This is a very poor way um, to, to, to do this kind of fencing, and it's a very good way to seriously injure yourself. So what you want to be doing on all of your thrusts and cuts is you want to be stepping on and off the heel, and you want to be rolling that pressure, rolling that pressure over your foot. You don't want to be sliding that pressure like this. And of course, when you're kicking off and going backwards, you're going to want to lift the heel and push off the heel. So leave that leg bent, lift the heel, and kick the heel away in order to get away. If you start doing it this way, very easy to roll your ankle, very easy to overcompensate, very easy to rip all these tiny little muscles in the front of your leg. So don't do that. Make sure in any of your cuts that your uh, feet are aligned properly on the target, you're stepping forward onto the heel, and then you're releasing off the heel. And that's how we're stepping in all of these cuts. So that's an important uh, safety PSA. But now we're going to be moving more specifically into the footwork. Now, we were intending to do a footwork in rough terrain. Um, the uh, the uh, sort of weather doesn't permit at the moment uh, to go out and do it in the rough terrain because that would mean my camera would be in rough terrain, which is really the issue. So uh, we're just going to be demonstrating how you should do it. Uh, but we're going to, we've got a fairly good terrain here that we're on. So the uh, First thing that first things first, uh, what should your footwork be normally, and then we'll talk about how can it be outside of the train. Uh, but before we can get started on that, we'll mention some sources. Um, McBain talks about anyone who's talking about. Uh, we have three basic uh, uh, types of sources. Um, the first is we have uh, accounts, which is to say someone talking about a sword fight they saw or talking about someone else. So the secondhand information uh, from people who uh, surround uh, sword fighting, period sword fighting. The second thing we have are uh, military um, sources, which are instruction books and also uh, some accounts, but accounts by people like McBain, who themselves are uh, sword fighters and fencers, who are either commenting on things that they have done or things that they have seen done, but it's a more firsthand uh, experience because they really know what they're talking about, they know what they're seeing, uh, and they're a more trustworthy source on those topics because they'll exaggerate in very specific ways. Um, so you have sources uh, that deal with the military nature of broadsword, and then we have another set of sources that come a little bit later, which is the gladiators who deal with, uh, who deal with uh, fencing as an art and fencing as a, a way of entertaining people and of course sport fencing and winning tournaments. So those are the basic forms uh, that you could categorize a lot of our sources into, and none of them are going to be particularly interested in going over the specifics of um, fencing in rough terrain. So in the military accounts, they're going to give you foot positions that work in all situations more, uh, and in um, stage fighting and in tournament fencing, you're going to be working with a specific set of terrains, so the footwork uh, compensates for that. So we're going to start with um, regimental, 
which, uh, as hopefully you're aware, as advanced students, deals with a line of attack that goes uh, from the back of the heel along the side of the foot straight forward uh, to your opponent. And that is the basic line of attack that we're dealing with with the regimental uh, fencing style. Your second position is here, your first position is here, your third position is slightly extended, but not super far forward. So this is our regimental style that we teach everybody. It's where you start as a beginner. Now, there is another system at play, which is uh, more of a side sword technique that uses a line of attack that goes from the middle of the arch of your foot forward, and your front foot is standing on the line of attack, uh, and then the same positions, first, second, and third here, and uh, that uses a narrower footwork, and um, in both of these footworks, as, a, as an exaggeration, what you might feel is that you're balancing kind of on the blade of your foot here and on the ball of your foot here because uh, a lot of your weight is back and you have the ball of your foot constantly lifting and dropping as you're stepping forward and you have the blade of your foot ready to engage that push action. So you may feel slightly unbalanced in some cases because you feel like you're standing on a triangle with a small edge over here and a point over here and that's how you're moving around the battlefield. So that uh, is very efficient, and it's an excellent way to uh, fence uh, on flat terrain and on predictable terrain. So what we're going to do to adjust our footwork for unpredictable or uneven terrain is we're going to switch into a, uh, into a more highland style. It's a more unpredictable footwork, and it's more balanced footwork. So we're going to turn this foot out. We're going to still have the line of attack between our feet and we're going to turn this foot out into a wider stance. Now, it's not an open horse stance like this, though we can use this stance as well. Uh, it's going to be light regimental, but instead of perfectly square at 90 degrees, you're slightly less and you're slightly more open. Now, instead of being leaning back like regimental, we're going to be centered this way. So we're going to open our footwork, bring that foot forward, drop our stance, sit, feel like you're sitting down, and uh, open your stance this way. This, hopefully you'll feel already, will give you a lot of stability. The second point that I want to make is I want you to focus on your feet and try to put the whole foot on the ground. So, especially if you've been uh, fencing for some time, a year, six months, or a year, uh, and you've been really working on the footwork that we've been teaching you, you're going to you're going to feel this more than somebody who's more used to this style of fencing. So, you're going to sit, you're going to be uh, um, very stable in that position, and you're going to drop your whole foot onto the ground. So you're going to roll this foot sort of forward so that it's all the way down, and you're going to roll this foot over that way so that it sits. Now my shoes uh, can demonstrate a little bit on their soles. You can see the wear and tear that it takes from this, the standard fencing guard, so you can see how the footwork actually weighs on the shoe. And that's where I uh, came to understand this difference is um, you're sitting and you're really, you're really uh, 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 on the whole foot. And the reason you want to do that is in case you can't use the whole foot for whatever reason. So if there's an obstacle um, or there's some sort of uh, uh, difficult terrain, and I'll use a shoe as my example. <clears throat> the point being that it is an unpredictable shape and it is, uh, it is uh, soft, so it gives a little bit. This is really the problem. If you just had a square or a table, you can move around that. The fact that this moves and it's unpredictable in its shape and it's unpredictable in how it's going to slip, because it may not slip on one side, it may slip on another side. So this sort of obstacle is really the worst kind. And having this set footwork means that if you step partially on something and you're, you're on the blade of your foot, it's much easier to fall off of it. If you're on the whole foot, it's much easier to compensate for the fact that you're now standing on something and to get your footwork realigned. Now, of course, you're not going to want to be standing on obstacles, but sometimes the terrain doesn't permit anything else. There's little moats and problems all over the, the terrain, and there's no way to, to stand in perfectly level terrain. So if you happen to be standing on something uneven, using the whole foot and using that level footwork allows you to go to decide, well, in this case, in this particular place that I'm standing, I'm better to be weighted a little forward and a little on my heel on this foot, and that's a better place for me to be. So if you're already there and you can move around quite easily and decide at the moment how you want to deal with that thing, you might want to adjust your footwork 
so that it's wherever it needs to be. And that, that adaptability of being able to adjust your footwork in the same stance so that I can move like this and still get basically the same uh, effect because you don't really know where your feet are going to be. So you can't rely on all of those precise, um, precise movements. Similarly, you're going to be stepping high to step over obstacles so you don't kick them back like this. You're going to want to be stepping over them as you're stepping. So you're going to want to practice that. And as you move forward and backward, you're going to want to be stepping high. And again, not landing so much just on the heel because if it's slick there, you're going to slip. Right? You want to be stepping a nice uh, short step, which I believe is why they recommend such a short step in the regimental style. You're going to be doing a nice short step, and it's going to land fairly flat on the foot. But again, you're going to be pushing off the heel. Even if it's slick, you're going to want to push off the foot and not push off the toes. Right? So uh, this is the situation you're going to be in. Stocky, sitting, open stance, and you're going to be wanting to move on your whole feet and experiencing what's going on below you and capable of changing your footwork, tightening, tightening it up, moving it side to side as well. So this is how you're going to want to practice that footwork. Feet up and open stance like that and also exchanging. Sometimes you're going to have to really change your footwork into a horse stance or something like that because you're up against a wall, you're up against a serious obstacle that you don't want to get involved with um, or something to that effect. So you're going to have to adapt uh, footwork such as the horse stance here, or even opposing footwork uh, that we see more commonly in targe, uh, those sorts of things because of the con constraints of uh, the environment, right? So if this is an obstacle that I don't want to get involved with and I want to step through here, I might step through onto this side because it's better for me than to try to step through over here and get all mixed up. So that would be my top recommendations for uh, if you guys are in really swampy or bad terrain. Uh, again, sit low, open your stance up, and be comfortable moving that stance and not being super precise about exactly how it is all the time. That's more of a sport fencing mentality. If you're more in an all-terrain mentality, you're gonna wanna be in that, uh, in that sort of stance. Side sword technique. Amateurs like you do two takes. I do one take. Print it. I'll be in my three-story trailer.